Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at Cushing's reflex, or Cushing's triad as it's sometimes known. This is something that will come up, especially in the ICU and trauma bays, patients who have sustained head traumas or otherwise large intracranial bleeds, sometimes very large tumors that produce mass effect. I found myself many times in medical school and residency attempting to memorize the triad or the reflex, but if we simply understand the physiology, everything falls into place very quickly and it's very easily recognizable. This will be a relatively quick video, so let's get started. And as always, I apologize for my atrocious drawings. I've already kind of laid out my schematic here. Um, and you can see that I have the black line delineates the skull. The pink delineates the brain. We have a red line in the middle, which is going to be our intracerebral artery. Our purple is our brain stem, and here is our heart. In green here on the left, I'm just going to write down what the... Cushing's reflex is, so if nothing else from this video, you know that. And the first part is hypertension, which I'm going to abbreviate as HTN, bradycardia, or our slow heartbeat, and irregular breathing, sometimes to the point of apnea. So if you get nothing else from this video, you should know that this is what makes up Cushing's reflex. Some people will say it's also increased intracranial pressure. That's not the case. That's the trigger for the reflex, for the triad. This is the triad, hypertension, bradycardia, irregular breathing. So now what we're going to do is talk about how we get to it and why it happens. So we need to remember that the skull is non-compliant. Non-compliant. And compliance is, you know, as an equation, is change in pressure over change in volume. And really what it's looking at is a structure's ability to expand in order to accommodate more of something uh, with a low, so that the pressure doesn't grow up. Remember that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So if we can expand our volume, the pressure will go down. That's why the left ventricle, for example, it's important that it is compliant, that it can stretch and fill with blood. Otherwise, the pressures in it would get super, super high if, as it fills, it couldn't stretch to accommodate it. The skull, though, doesn't stretch because it's bone, so it's non-compliant, and that's important for all of this. Now, I always come back to the equation, force equals mass times acceleration, and pressure equals force over area. So pressure is equal to mass times acceleration over area. And what this means is if our mass increases within the skull, um, I, I know this is not a direct you know, physics correlation because area I think is two dimensional and volume is three dimensional, but the, the point remains the same that if you increase your mass without increasing the area in which the mass is being held, the pressure will also go up. And that's what happens with bleeding or, or intracranial pathologies that cause an increase in some type of mass, be it um, blood, be it swelling, be it whatever it is, tumors. So now imagine we get hit in the head and we develop this large hematoma, subdural bleed here, and it starts to put pressure on the brain and it starts to push everything down. Well, what this is going to do is now put pressure on our intracerebral arteries and it's going to narrow the lumen of them. Well, the brain doesn't like that. So one is insult results in increased intracranial pressure, increased pressure within the skull, which then leads to compression of intracranial vessels. Now, like I said, our brain doesn't like it because our brain likes oxygen and oxygen comes with the blood. This results in stage one of the Cushing reflex, which is our sympathetic system kicks in here with our heart in order to increase our cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. And our body says we need to get more blood to our brain, and so we're going to increase our cardiac output via the sympathetic nervous system. We're going to speed up our heart rate, we're going to speed up our, 
our, um, or we're going to increase our stroke volume, increase our pressure in order to improve circulation up to the brain from the heart. So, like I mentioned, um, we will get this increased sympathetic tone. So I'm just going to undo this so it's you know kind of not ugly and in the way. Now, this rise in blood pressure is going to rise enough to overcome the intracranial pressure to ensure that blood vessels within the brain stay open and perfusing. Now, phase two begins when the baroreceptors in the aortic arch, so I'll write that over here in blue. Phase two is baroreceptors in our aortic arch are going to see that increase in blood pressure. And what it's going to do is it's going to send uh, a signal via the vagus nerve. I'm just going to draw this over here. Vagus nerve. And the job of the vagus nerve is going to slow down the heart rate. And that has to do with the fact that our body is designed, or rather evolved, such that cardiac output always wants to be constant. So if our heart rate goes up, our stroke volume should decrease, and blood pressure is a surrogate for our stroke volume, and vice versa. So if our blood pressure goes up, our heart rate will then go down. So now we have both our sympathetic and our parasympathetic systems firing in order to get phase one, which results in hypertension, and tachycardia, but then phase two, which brings our heart rate down, resulting in bradycardia with this hypertension. Now, I'm going to make a small note down here in brown with a star to remember, and this will come up, and I'm sure people have heard of it, Cushing's ulcers. And this is part of stage two. Uh, so as your parasympathetic discharge increases, it results in a rest and digest you know, tone of the body, which produces increased in your digestive work, which will in turn result in your stomach producing more acid. More gastric acid output can result in ulcers. So that's why these patients in the ICU are on GI prophylaxis a lot of times when they have head trauma to prevent from Cushing's ulcers. Now the third and final phase, and this is the abnormal breathing, abnormal breathing, is a result of compression of brainstem. So as we increase our ICP, remember, because the skull is a bony structure, the brain has to go somewhere. So hopefully we all remember this space here is called the foramen magnum. It's a space where the, um, where the brainstem leaves the skull, well, the brain begins to herniate into the space where the brainstem is, and this puts direct pressure on the brainstem. And as we know, the brainstem is responsible for our breathing. This can result in an abnormal breathing pattern or sometimes simply apnea. So that's Cushing's reflex. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to write in. Click the like button below, subscribe, follow us on Instagram at Count Backwards from 10, and stay tuned for the next video.